Hey everyone, in today's video, we're going to be looking at 32 different Linux commands that every software developer ought to know. Since many of these commands have a lot of different options and arguments that can be used with them, I'm only going to be covering how each of these commands is commonly used. I will also likely be breaking this video into two parts to make sure that it isn't unnecessarily long. If that does end up happening, then I'll leave a link to part 2 of this video in the description below. With that being said, let's jump right into it. So man is arguably one of the most important Linux commands that you could learn, because it's used to get more information on any other Linux command that you might know of. So let's say you want to remove a directory which has a bunch of files and other directories within it, and you know that you can get the job done with the rm command, but you don't exactly remember the format of the command and what options you should use with it. In such scenarios, you can type man followed by the name of the command to get more information on it. Over here, you can see that you get a quick summary of what the command is about. You get a quick synopsis on how to use the command along with the options that can be chained with it. You also get a description on the command itself, as well as more information on each of the options that was specified in the synopsis. PWD stands for Present Working Directory and is a simple but very useful command used to display the path to the current working directory. Over here, you can see that I'm currently within a directory or folder called Linux commands and typing pwd simply prints the path to this directory. Open is a simple but very useful command to open a file or a folder just as if you had double clicked on it. So currently I have a file called file.txt and a folder and let's say I wanted to open file.txt. I can do so by simply typing open file.txt. You can see that the file was opened with the default text editor present on my MacBook. Similarly, doing open space folder opens the folder with the finder application on my MacBook. By the way, you can also navigate to certain URLs on your web browser with the open command. So for example, if I type open space https colon slash slash google.com, you can see that Google opens up in my default browser application. ls is commonly used to list the contents of the current working directory. So typing ls over here, we can see that we've got three files and three folders within this directory. Two important flags that I used with the ls command are the dash a and dash l flags. ls dash a lists all the files and folders within the present working directory as well as any hidden files or folders that may be within the directory. By the way, hidden files and folders are prefixed with a dot before their name. ls-l lists the content of the current working directory in a long format, and that just means that the command displays additional information associated with each listed file or folder, such as the file mode, the owner name, and group name. By the way, you can chain these commands together by typing ls-al to get a list of all the files and folders, including the hidden ones displayed in a long format. MKDIR is used to make directories of folders. So to make a single directory within the Linux commands folder, we can just type mkdir followed by the name of the directory that we wish to create. In this case, I'm just going to call it folder. So typing ls, we can see that a directory called folder has been created. mkdir can also be used to create multiple directories at the same time. So we can do this by just chaining the names of different folders or directories that we wish to create. So for example, let's say I wish to create three directories called folder 1, 2, and 3. I can just do so by chaining the names one after another.
Another common usage of this command is to create nested directories of folders. And you can do that using the dash p flag. Touch is similar to mkdir, but it's used to create new files instead of folders. You can create a single file by specifying the name of the file name after the touch command. In this case, I'm just creating a text file called file.txt. You can also create multiple files of different types at the same time by chaining their names after the touch command. RMDIR stands for Remove Directory and is commonly used to remove empty directories. Over here, there's an empty directory called folder and to remove it, I can just do it RMDIR space folder. Keep in mind that RMDIR can only remove empty folders. If you want to remove folders along with all the contents within that folder, use the RM command. RM stands for remove and is a more powerful version of the RMDIR command. It can be used to remove files, empty directories, as well as non-empty directories. So within the Linux commands directory, I've created two files, file1.txt, file2.txt, as well as three folders. Out of these three folders, non-empty folder has some files within it. We can simply remove a file by typing rm space the file name that we wish to remove. So doing rm file1.txt has removed that file. To remove an empty directory or empty folder, we can use the dash d flag and specify the name of the folder that we wish to remove. To remove non-empty folders, we can use the dash r flag. And if you wish to simply wipe out all the files and folders within your current directory, you can simply use rm-r followed by an asterisk, which is a wildcard used to indicate that you wish to remove all the contents of the current working directory. Be careful when you're using the rm command because it doesn't move the files and folders to your bin. Instead, it deletes these files off your computer permanently. CP stands for copy and is used to copy a file from one location to another. Within the Linux commands folder, I've created a file called file1.txt and an empty directory called folder. If you cd into folder, you can see that there's nothing within the folder. So let's say I want to copy file1.txt into folder. I can do so with the CP command by specifying the file that I wish to copy as well as the location that I wish to copy it into. So if you do an ls, you can still see that file1.txt exists within the Linux commands folder. But if we cd into folder and do ls, we can see that file1.txt has been copied there. mv or move is very similar to copy and is used to move a file from one location to another. So once again, within the Linux commands folder, there's a file called file1.txt and an empty folder called folder. If I cd into it, you can see it's empty. If I wish to move file1.txt into folder, I can do so by typing mv, followed by the file that I wish to move, and the folder that I wish to move it into. So if I do an ls within the Linux commands folder, you can see that file1.txt no longer exists over here. But if I cd into folder and do an ls, you can see that file1.txt has been moved into folder. History is a very useful command that can be used to identify all the past commands that you've typed into your Linux shell. This is especially useful when you've used the command in the past but can't really remember 
how you used it, or what the arguments or flags for that command were. So for example, let's say I forgot how to use the diff command, but I know I used it to identify the difference between two files. By typing history, I can easily identify how the command was used. Diff is a useful command that can be used to quickly identify the difference between two files. So I've got two text files, file1.txt and file2.txt. Typing diff along with the two file names quickly identifies the difference between these two files. In this case, you can see that file1.txt contains the text hello world and a new line after it but file2.txt has the text goodbye world and no new line at the end of the file. Head is commonly used to print a certain number of lines of a file to the console. This is very useful when you're viewing log files that might contain thousands of lines. In this example, I've got a file called logfile.txt, which simply contains 20 lines of text. Typing head space, the name of the file, prints out the first 10 lines of the file. By the way, 10 is just the default number and we can change that number by using the dash n flag. So let's say I wanted to print out the first 15 lines. So I can do that by typing head space dash n, followed by the number of lines that I wish to print, in this case 15, and the file name. And you can see now we've got 15 lines. Tail is very similar to head, but it's instead used to print a certain number of lines from the bottom of a file. So once again, I've got the same log file, which has 20 lines of text within it. Typing tail space log file prints the bottom 10 lines of the file. And we can also specify the number of lines to print using the dash n flag. Echo is used to print information onto the console. So if I type echo hello world, you see that the echo command just prints hello world back to the console. Although this might seem strange at first, it's actually pretty useful if you want to do stuff like print out the values of certain environment variables, or search for files with a certain extension type. Another common use of the echo command is within shell scripts to print out statuses to the console. The ping command is commonly used to check and diagnose the connectivity between a host machine and a server. The command takes in a URL or an IP address as an argument and sends packets of data to the specified URL or IP address. For example, typing ping google.com allows us to confirm that my computer is able to talk to Google servers. We can also ping Google servers by using its IP address instead of the URL. By default, the packets sent are 64 bytes in size with one packet of data being sent every one second. And the ping test continues on indefinitely as you can see on the screen until we kill it by hitting Ctrl plus C on our keyboard. You can modify the number of packets to send by using the dash C flag. So over here you can see that I'm sending five packets of data to Google after which the ping test terminates. You can also modify the default packet size by using the dash S flag. So you can see that I specified 10 bytes of data to be sent, but 18 bytes of data are actually being sent to Google servers. Now that's just happening because the ping test adds on an additional 8 bytes of header data to the packets. The I flag can be used to change the interval at which each packet of data is sent. So now you can see one packet of data being sent every two seconds. I'm going to end this video over here since it's getting a bit long. 
but so far we've covered 17 of the 32 Linux commands. Stay tuned for part 2 of the video where we cover the remaining 15 commands.